afternoon. This is Dania from the PM Radio Westminster, broadcasting live from London. Normality is in the air. It looks like we might be finally able to resume our life as normal after almost a year of lockdown and restrictions. It's sunny here in London and there are good vibes. In today's episode, we will chat to two guests on two different topics, machine learning and project management books. Fuad Isa, a senior machine learning engineer, will be joining us from Malaga in Spain, and Nick Lamru, a principal lecturer in project management from uh, Westminster Business School and the founder of the Project Management Book Club, will be joining us live from London. But first, and as usual, let's hear some of our latest news collected, prepared, and edited by our uh, beloved editor, PM Radio editor, Carla Roch. So Carla, thank you for preparing this. So the first item of news is on some funding and um, news on money is always welcome. Maguire confirms three billion pound financing of UK green projects. Australian infrastructure investor Maguire has financed billions of pounds of environmentally friendly projects as part of an agreement in its purchase of the UK's green investment group, GIG or GIG, from the government three years ago. Maguire, a global financial services group, operates in 31 markets in asset management, retail and business banking, wealth management, renewable development, investment banking and others. Now, originally, the Green Investment Bank was set up under the coalition government in 2012 to draw private capital into offshore wind farms, waste to energy plants and also energy saving projects. More than half the investment capital went to wind farms, where the UK is now the global leader in offshore capacity, according to a recent Global Wind Council Work Energy report. Maguire promised to finance three billion pounds in green energy projects in the UK and Europe over the three years following its 1.6 billion acquisition of the group, which was then known as the Green Investment Bank in August 2017. In February, in a joint venture of the GIG and Total, the French oil company, successfully secured seabed lease rights to jointly develop a 1.5 gigawatt offshore wind project. The project, which will be located off the UK's East Anglian coast, could deliver up to 1.5 gigawatts of renewable electricity and represents a significant early stage investment in the UK offshore wind sector for both companies. Now on consultancies, how much do experts cost? Government consultancy contracts spark who does what debate. At the height of the lockdown in London last year, teams of consultants were trying to figure out how the UK should respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. After years of civil service cutbacks, the government needed staff quickly. Every policy decision required work and consultants were the only workforce readily available. In early March, the government suspended competitive tendering so that contracts could be awarded fast. Earlier, uh, either with work simply handed to consultants, which happened last year, or added to existing framework agreements. At least 152 contracts worth £330 million were awarded to the eight largest consulting firms between April 2020 and February this year. This is according to data from Tussle, a research company that monitors government contracts. KPMG, one of the four big accounting and consultancy multinational organizations, argues that the use of consultants helps government respond swiftly in emergencies. Across the globe, governments call on experts to help them address the urgent challenges that society faces like COVID-19, KPMG says. 
The use of external specialists enables the public sector to get critical projects done, particularly when capacity, skills and expertise is needed at scale and under intense time pressure. As countries seek to return to sustainable growth, these projects are investments to support long-term economic recovery. However, Liz David Barrett, Professor of Governance and Integrity at the University of Sussex, says that by awarding a few management consultancies a large slice of the work, the government appears to have created a parallel state. The government should have been more prepared for a possible pandemic earlier, and lack of planning forced it into emergency contracts when they shouldn't have needed to be, the professor says. Lack of planning and capacity create a situation where the risks of corruption, poor accountability and weak governance increase, she argues. Edward Haig, Joint Managing Director at Source Global Research, a data provider on consulting, cautions that many of the larger consultancies are also announced job pluses and pay cuts during the pandemic as the gains on COVID-19 related work were offset by the loss of projects elsewhere. However, with criticism prom prompted by reports that some consultants from BCG, which won 30 million pound worth of coronavirus related work, charged fees worth 7,000 pounds a day. Haig acknowledges that consulting fees can be difficult for civil servants to swallow. The nature of most consulting work makes it very hard to find accurate and reliable ways to measure the value that's being delivered, he says. This raises some tension between which projects should be done by government and its civil servants and what should be delegated to the private sector and its consultants, which might end up being much more expensive than doing it in-house. On PMOs, project management offices, strong but flexible, creating effective central project management offices. Anyone who is a project manager or uh, is involved in managing project knows what PMOs are. Now, what does central PMOs mean and what does it do? Central project management offices help to boost skills, delivery and oversight across departments. At a recent global government forum, GGF webinar, experts highlighted the need to balance greater coordination and governance with the flexibility and autonomy required by frontline staff. Governments are often responsible for delivering some of the biggest projects in the world, from mass urban mass transit schemes, such as London's Crestrail, to international events like the Olympics, and yet, face unique organizational challenges that can challenge delivery. Infrastructure projects, for example, can be years, if not decades, in the making. So it's inconvenient when general elections regularly lead to sharp changes of direction. Incoming ministers may have no knowledge of the project and may even have campaigned against it. Projects funded by public money attract close media scrutiny and many programs involve complex interlinked delivery projects controlled by multiple departments and agencies. Now, to try to address some of these issues and challenges, many national and state governments have set up project management offices, PMOs, central units that provide oversight, tools and assistance for delivery teams help to build specialist workforces and drive cross-government reforms by tracking project development, offering training, developing policies and developing specialists, PMOs can play a key role in improving government's project success rates. The benefits and challenges associated with PMOs were debated last month at a GGF webinar supported by the knowledge partner Axelis. The panel found that while such offices can increase efficiency and ease communication across disciplines and cultures, they still require st strict governance and agile structures to ensure they do not just become another layer of bureaucracy. It's worth mentioning that a member of the panel was Alan Thompson, Global PPM Product Ambassador from Axelis, whom we were delighted to have as our guest on PM Radio last June on an episode on project management best practice. Greetings to Alan. Uber drivers are workers, not self-employed, 
Supreme Court rules. The decision could mean thousands of Uber drivers are entitled to minimum wage and holiday pay. The ruling could leave the ride-hailing app facing a hefty compensation bill and have wider consequences for the gig economy. Uber said the ruling centered on a small number of drivers and it had since made changes to its business. In a long-running legal battle, Uber had finally appealed to the Supreme Court after losing three earlier rounds. Uber's share price dipped as US trading began on last Friday as investors grappled with what impact the London ruling could have on the firm's business model. It's being challenged by its drivers in multiple countries over whether they should be classed as workers or self-employed. The story of Uber reminds us of the importance of responsibility and business sustainability from economic, environmental, and social perspectives. What might seem to be working at first might well become a big source of challenge and risk later. Back to coronavirus. AI used to predict the next coronavirus. Well, I hope the prediction says it's way far in the future. A team of scientists has used artificial intelligence to work out where the next novel coronavirus could emerge. The researchers used a combination of fundamental biology and machine learning. Their computer algorithm predicted many more potential hosts of new virus strains than have previously detected. Dr. Marcus Balgrove, a virologist from the University of Liverpool in the UK, who was actually involved in the study, explained, we want to know where the next coronavirus might come from. One way they are generated is through recombination between two existing coronaviruses. So two viruses infect the same cell and they recombine into a daughter virus that would be an entirely new strain. The researchers were able to plug existing biological evidence into an algorithm, teaching a computer how to spot viruses and host species that were most likely to be a source of this recombination. The scientists say their findings could help to target the surveillance of, for the new diseases, possibly helping prevent the next pandemic before it starts. But it's virtually impossible to survey all animals all the time. So our approach enables prioritization. It says these are the species to watch, the University of Liverpool researcher added. Well, let's get prepared and hope for the best. On this note, it's time to welcome our first guest, Fuad Isa, to the studio. Uh, Fuad will be joining, he's actually based, he used to be based in London, but will be joining us today from uh, Spain and uh, trying to explain to us some of the fundamentals of machine learning, trying to understand what machine learning is all about. Why is it becoming popular, uh, almost the most popular uh, out of AI techniques and tools? So let's welcome Fuad to the studio. Hi, Daniel. Hi, Fuad. Hello, how are you? How is it in Spain, in Malaga? Uh, it's pretty good, actually. It's uh, sunny as usual. Pretty okay. nice. Okay, good. It's sunny here in London, not as oh. usual. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I cannot make anyone jealous, I guess. <laughs> uh, okay, you're making everybody jealous, but not for today, at least. Um, okay, thank you for joining us. I know you are a, a senior machine learning engineer and you worked, uh, you worked for the startups and you are still working. So can I start with a simple question? How do machines learn? Do they learn the same way we learn? And how do, they, do we make them learn? A very good question, Dania. Uh, I mean, it is the essence of the whole field of AI. AI is trying to understand how we learn and try to imitate that, make them make machines imitate that. And it all boils down to, I mean, to answer that question, it all boils down to maths. Um, so uh, in AI, we're trying to understand how the brain works and try to somewhat 
uh, repeat that um, in in silicon chips. And if you think about it, there are there are a lot of evidence. There is a lot of evidence that shows that the brain learns somewhat in a probabilistic way. So it is somewhat mathematical. So we have our impression of the world, uh, our model of the world, and certain probability priors of how things should be. And then we receive new evidence, whether it's visual or um, through sound, and uh, we make sense based on what we already know, the priors, and then this evidence uh, updates what we already know uh, in order to learn. And that you could trace that also to illusions. Optical illusions are a case where our priors actually override the new evidence that we see. So in essence, uh, we, we learn in a mathematical way. And uh, AI researchers, I think they started in the 70s looking into probabilistic learning instead of logic-based learning. So prior to that, most of AI was based on logic, which is very brittle. And the breakthrough or the new advancement is relying more on probabilistic learning. And neural networks, for example, that many people may hear, hear of is one way of doing that. And they actually showed up in the 70s. But at that time, there wasn't a lot of uh, computational power to actually test them on big data. And in the last 10 years, we've had a lot of GPUs and computational power to actually test that. And that's when we've seen the real power of probabilistic learning instead of logic-based learning. Um, so we, you can think of it as a, we're modeling the world uh, through numbers. And um, one, one example of that is deep learning, for example, to answer your question, how do machines learn? For one, one example of that is supervised learning, which we hear of. And one example of supervised learning is deep learning, where we use deep neural networks to um, approximate how things work. So for example, you have, uh, it essentially boils down to you have an input, you have an output. Usually in your logic-based learning, or when you do maths, you have your x and you put it in a function and the function spits out y. What we're trying to do here is the kind of different where we have the x, we have the y's, we have the inputs, we have the outputs, and we're trying to figure out what is this function that, that causes that, what is the underlying process. And then once we've learned that function, that is basically the learning, then we try to apply it to any new data out there. Um, so if you take example Siri, for example, uh, an example of that series probably had a lot of X's and Y's where the X, the input is your voice and the output is maybe the textual representation of that voice. And the algorithm was trained and then such that for any new voice, it can kind of like represent it in text. And of course, it's not as simple as that. There are a lot of things where you need to inject bias. You may need to kind of inject the representation of what this, what is the meaning of this, of, of this text to help the algorithm. But essentially, to answer your question in a very short way, we machines do try to kind of learn somewhat similar to, to the brain, but from our current brain, I mean, our understanding of the brain is not yeah, complete, but we think that at least the current probabilistic way of learning is the brain does that in some some sort. Fascinating. So this probabilistic learning that you mentioned, um, do we do we do both as humans? We do probabilistic and we do logic, logical based learning. We probably do that. I mean, I personally, there is a lot of use. I think in the AI sphere. Uh, some people would say that the only way we will reach true AI is uh, once we manage to combine both probabilistic learning and rule-based kind of learning. Uh, and the brain probably does that. I mean, it is difficult to answer that question, but one would assume that, yes, I mean, we are, the brain is doing something that we're missing, right? Otherwise, we would have a, we would have created a brain. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it, um, I think I think there is a lot of opinions on that, but like one opinion is that yes, the, the way forward for AI research is to combine both because the probabilistic learning gives you the flexibility, the logic-based learning gives you somewhat of a, a good way to ground things down into into reason. I see. Can you give us an example of a probabilistic learning, uh, just for the audience to understand what that means for uh, us as a human? So, if I'm learning a new language for example, uh, or a new, a new role, learning, reading all about COVID-19 restrictions and learning the new, the new set of rules. How does this probabilistic learning occur in the mind, in, in simple terms? Why do we call it probabilistic? Uh, it's, if you think of it, it's because it's, I mean, it, there is no absolute right 
or wrong answer. If you think about it, I mean, logic-based learning, if, if you have a, maybe if you have a one plus one, the operator plus, you know exactly what that means and you can apply it to everything. But you probably cannot have an operator in terms of words, like the word house, that is, or the word to, to, um, to go, right? You cannot have it as an operator where it takes in a specific input and it has a specific output or its meaning depends on things around it. So therefore you could represent that meaning in terms of uh, probabilities that maybe in this context, it will probably 70% mean that it is, um, uh, for example, the word bank, 70% it will mean a bank where it's a place where you put money and maybe 30% it may mean a riverside, like a river bank, right? So it is, you cannot have like a specific operator to tell you what that word means. And that is probably like where you could understand probabilistic learning is that a lot of things in life, they are not like white or black, right? Uh, whereas in logic, you need to have like, uh, an operator with a predefined input, predefined output, like this is this is what that operator does, right? Uh, amazing. Thank you for the examples. Uh, so, is this related somehow to fuzzy logic? When you say, to, when I tell you someone is tall, you might understand me, but if I am telling a machine that someone is tall, they might need to apply some sort of probabilistic algorithms to to know what tall means right you need to input some data to make it learn that tall is probably in that range uh plus or minus is that is, is, the, is it related to probabilistic learning to fuzzy logic in one way or another uh it is it is somewhat related as in um i think with fuzzy logic you probably determining predetermining um with probabilistic learning, you you let the machine, you give the machine the examples and you okay, let it okay. figure out for itself what is likely, what is not. Okay, uh, you right, feed it with that. data. Yeah, you just give it the data, you build the algorithm to kind of take into account the biases, what biases you want to put into it, but the algorithm eventually just takes in the input, and uh, the inputs and the outputs initially, and then it will figure out um, how to represent things in a way that makes sense such that it can give that output given a certain input okay uh, excellent so now you said that you need to feed data to the machine why is machine learning becoming so popular is it because of the big data we have nowadays because we have lots of data is, has so, this yeah. it is exactly that i mean it's becoming popular because if you think about it it's very revolutionary you can apply it to anything whenever you have inputs and outputs you can get the machine where previously you needed to, um, you can automate a lot of things now, given that you have this capability of like, I'll give you what's input, what's the input, I'll give you what's the expected output. And then you can repeat that for any new input. Like, um, and for example, um, like take an example where it's being used or there are trials of, of it being used is, for example, in risk management, the transaction monitoring. So usually banks need to figure out that you, you usually have rules of what sort of transactions should be flagged for review. Like, are they, uh, for example, the uh, frequency of the transaction is a feature, the amount, the, the number of uh, the amount of money being transferred, the sender, the receiver. Um, so you could give it if you have the right data if you have enough data of what is a suspicious transaction you can give those to the machine such that the machine can then run on a huge amount of transaction and flags up the ones that are suspicious another example is um, i mean another example of where we have data for example uh, medicine in in medicine you probably could there are a lot of um, new um, products coming out where uh, you, you have you have access you have some data about what are the symptoms for a specific disease and um, what are, what is the diagnosis so you have symptoms and diagnosis and uh, case studies of patients so if you as long as you have that you can train the machine to kind of figure out right given these symptoms this is the this is the patient this is these are the attributes of this patient we could the machine could recommend what diseases. Uh, that patient may have. And of course, that will 
currently that is done still the doctor plays a part but it just makes the doctor's life easier another example is um uh cancer like um cancer detection in in radiography uh so uh, if you have a, an x-ray image uh if you know what x-ray images have had cancer then you could train the machines kind of like for any new x-ray image or any medical imaging you can train it such that it predicts that this is a this is a this is a position of the cancer cells and as you can see like whenever you have data of inputs and outputs you can automate that and it's it's it, and you can apply that to so many fields that is why and there is a lot of work to be done because there are so many different types of data, so many different fields, and that's why I think it's taking a lot of it's a it's a hot thing right now because there are, there is a lot to be done. Yeah, and I think um, we've just received a comment from um, Nadia. She's uh, saying that machine learning technologies can be used to reduce project risks. Uh, you mentioned risk management for ad and increase project management productivity. Um, similarly to what you mentioned on uh, bank transactions, because you have now data, you can apply it, you can make use of it, you can take advantage of the data you have to make the machine learn uh, what could be risky transactions. I think this should be very useful in the age of cryptocurrency as well, don't you think? Yeah. With yeah, all these, yeah, yeah. Um, now, let's move further into more details about managing. When you are leading on a machine learning uh, project or program, and just I wanted to say to everybody who are listening to us, please, if you have any comments or questions, just post it now because Fuad is with us for only a short time. He's leaving uh, in about five or six minutes. Uh, he's going to, to teach some machine what to do. So uh, if you have any questions, please post them now. Now Fuad, Agile methodologies to manage projects. What do you think of them? When you are leading on developing a, a new code or a new machine learning program or projects, what kind of project management methodology do you use? Do you use Agile or you don't use it and why? Um, it's a really interesting question, Daniel, because I think now that machine learning is a, it's a new thing, right? Like we've, we've been doing it I mean, we've been doing it in different forms, but the, the 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 latest advances of machine learning were only been implemented in 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 production in industry since maybe 2013, let's say. So this is this is being evolving and improving. And uh, with agile uh, methodologies, I mean, they are the best for software development, uh, as opposed to waterfall, uh, where with agile you're kind of responding to the customers uh the, the clients uh, requests and you're um you're continuously evaluating where you're going and what you're doing now agile is very good but one one thing i think it's i think agile for machine learning is good but it it will need some sort of a top up right because if we talk about machine research machine learning projects uh, like pure research machine learning projects I mean, I think they use different methodologies. It's a research project. Agile doesn't work. It's 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 a different thing. But when we're talking about applied research, where in industry you are trying to build a product, of course you will use Agile. And in any machine learning product, there will be a lot of things that are not just the machine learning. So Agile will work very well for those. But when it comes to the machine learning component, you probably need to add from experience and from seeing people talking about that and thinking about what's the best way to approach machine learning project, um, you probably need a top up there to deal with the uncertainty that machine learning entails. Because usually software development, you know exactly what what could happen if you follow a certain route or not really. Like you could test what output, you know what the output would be. You could you could determine what that what what your desired output is. Whereas with machine learning, because of this probabilistic approach, you will, you don't know, it may work, it may not. There is a lot of uncertainty. An algorithm that has worked on different type of data may not work on your data. There are a lot of moving parts in machine learning. So you have the training data, you have your test data, you have your algorithm, and then you have your real data. So you train your algorithm on training and you test it on your test data. But then in every new product, your test data may not be representative of real data and there may be a shift. Your algorithm may be better suited for built on a different type or has proven to be working on 
on different types of data, but now you're applying it for this product and may not work so well. So there is this probabilistic, there is perhaps a good way to plan it is to think of all the steps that you need to do and give it a certain probability such that you say, okay, I'm going to do step A, that may work 80%. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not, it's, we're quite sure it may work, so 80%. But then maybe step two may be very unlikely, it's like 20%. It's, uh, it's something that we haven't done before. And step three depends on step two. So having that probabilistic approach will help you set expectations, right? And perhaps try different approaches. So for step two, there is perhaps 20% uh, going to work. You put many people on it and you put maybe many different approaches to achieve what it wants to achieve, such, such that if one thing doesn't work out, you have an alternative. And I think that's, that's what's different because you cannot expect that every step will work out as you want it. So you need to kind of like think what is the most uncertain step and try to mitigate for that. And then also that helps setting the expectations right and the time frame right. So Agile is good, but you need to kind of add in that aspect of uncertainty when planning. It's interesting because, you know, Agile um, has been developed and introduced into the uh, world of project management as a methodology uh, best to deal with uncertainty because you have an uncertain scope. So maybe you have some idea about the, the end product, but it's not very certain what this product is going to entail or include. So the scope is a bit fuzzy. Uh, so apparently, waterfall methodology will never work with machine learning projects. Agile might work because it could deal better with uncertainty. But as you can saying, it looks like these type of projects uh, involve a lot of experiments. So it's even a much higher level of uncertainty that even Agile uh, could struggle to deal with. So now when you are leading on these projects, as you said, you have a steps. So is there any, um, any tools you use, any techniques you use when you are planning, you have a customer and you need you have to meet a deadline and um, you are setting up this overall plan to deliver a product at, by, the, for, by the deadline. Mm -hmm. Any specific techniques to deal with stakeholders, to respond to the client requests, to, to plan the project? I think um, we usually use Agile. In order to deal with the machine learning uncertainty, um, we don't put a lot of... Um, we don't set the expectations high. Everybody knows that it depends, things depends. So we leave it open. Like for example, we will have, we could promise to have a machine learning model, but for example, it's its performance is is something to be dealt with, to be clarified as we go. So what While, about the client then? Hmm? What about the client? Are they happy that you are? They know, they know. So yeah. you you have to educate the clients to tell them how machine learning works in the sense that it is it is uncertain. It depends on their data. So until you actually work on it, you will not know what can be achieved because it depends from different data to another. The algorithm may or may not work. You may have, I mean, of course, you may find another algorithm that works, but that takes it into your time. So you could promise something, but there is this element of fuzziness, like maybe, maybe not. We can probably give you something that predicts whatever you want to predict, but the accuracy of that is something we cannot determine until we actually do part of the building. Maybe not all of it, but like actually start experimenting. And sometimes what we do is that before you commit, I mean, if you're dealing directly with a client, that may be the best approach so far, or involve them in this probabilistic uh, planning and tell them that these are the steps, this may work, this may not. Uh, but another thing, if you're working to build something internally for a company, within a company, is uh, to have like a feasibility research bit. So before you actually commit to the project, you have a few weeks where you're actually prototyping. And that, that's, I think, what happens in, in, in big companies. You try to prototype something, you spend a little bit of time where it's not really planned, it's just like a one person thing, or maybe a, a team, a team effort. Um, and then you look into it and then decide what can be and cannot be done. And I think the probabilistic management system, like what we just mentioned, would also work for such projects where maybe a big team is working on it. 
So if you have one or two people, then it's easy to organize. But if you have maybe 10 people, it's good to specify what are the steps that are certain, that are not, such that you may put five different people working on five different approaches for one of these steps that is not very certain, right? Okay, interesting. You know what you said could pose many challenges for contact management and contact to drafting in the first place, because on what basis? You mentioned prototyping. This is possible if you are working within your own in-house, because you've got the data, you can use it to prototype something. But if you are dealing with a client, then you need access to data before you can build a prototype, before you can decide whether it's doable or not. So, um, so contracts in this field must be very, very challenging to draft and to sign and to agree on. And I'm, I'm thinking without a partnership approach to such projects, it would be nearly impossible to, um, uh, you know, to, to start doing any job because it's difficult if the client is difficult, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, usually from one experience that I have is that you explain to the client that it is uncertain and you do not put a specific um, evaluation or quality that they're aiming for in the contract. But you do you get do paid. You, you still get paid. You, you do get paid because you, you have to put in the, the effort in order to find yeah. out what's doable, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think yeah. many clients are okay with that risk because, uh, I mean, it's a um, self-fulfilling prophecy, uh, for prophecy, right? Everybody wants machine learning right now. And that's why like everybody goes into the machine learning and they know it's uncertain. So they're like, we're gonna, we still want it. We'll take the risk because it's working for other people. Yeah, with high rewards come high risks. So um, I guess this is, uh, this is the, the situation right now. Uh, for Ad, uh, this is very interesting. And um, I know you are busy and um, uh, I have to, um, uh, to stop the conversation right now. Let me just check. Phil is saying something about blockchain in project management could be useful too. Um, that could work as well. Um, I think I have something, another question about, okay, this is interesting. Something about, just a final note, how intelligent you think machines will be in the future, Fuad? Would they be exactly like us, emotionally aware? emotionally intelligent and how long would that take in your own personal opinion yeah um my personal opinion of course there are so many opinions on that um, my own personal opinion is that we will probably reach a stage where um i don't think we will have machines that are replicating or like that look like not really look behave like us we may get there maybe after 100 years or something uh, but what we'll go through, we'll probably reach a stage where machines are augmenting our intelligence. So um, probably the direction that we hope we should go towards is that getting the AI to help us become achieve what we want to achieve in a in a more efficient way. And I think that kind of captures what uh, Elon Musk and his um, startup uh, Neuralink, I think, uh, he's trying to to go to that direction to make us all cyborgs, right? <laughs> like get, get the AI to help us rather than to be a separate entity than us. Uh, I think, I mean, aside from that, I do think that machines will, um, there, there's a lot of work to embody research, uh, to embody uh, emotions, to try how to understand what emotions are, to put like machines that may be emotional. I think machines will be able to re imitate what we do at some point uh, but they will still be missing there will always be missing something that we can do um, because we are building them right and if since we're building them unless we give them the true representation of the world um, which we are probably not unable to do that ourselves exactly then we're never going to be um, as as good as us uh, not as good but like exactly like us they may be better in other things which may be scary but i don't think they will be like us right they it's not going to be the same as the human intelligence not to yeah. say that it's it's it's, it's going to be worse it could be better in certain ways but i think it's difficult for it to be exactly the same yeah uh thank you for add jeffrey quantum computing would be integral in the advancement of disruptive technologies absolutely um and uh, nadia is saying maybe project managers will be replaced by machines in the future. Uh, actually, I'm going to discuss this with Nick 
next because um, we are going to talk about leadership books and uh, I'm going to ask Nick this question for Ad later um, about whether product managers can actually, uh, uh, we, we can teach machines to become good leaders. Let's see if we can do this at some point. But thank you very much for, uh, for, you for having us today. And um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the day in, in the sunny Malaga. And uh, yeah, wish to see you at some point face to face yeah. here again. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, once everything gets better in London. Thank you so much for having me, and it's, uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, okay, so. Um, Thanks, obviously, to Fuad for uh, joining us. And uh, I'm going to ask Nick to join now. Uh, Nick is joining us from London. So let's welcome Nick to the studio. Hello, Nick. How are you? Good today? Oh, I'm, yes, yes, I'm fine. Uh, that was a nice conversation. And uh, I think an AI would be confused because the studio looks very much like my own house here. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, No, they know all about it. They know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. OK, uh, lovely mm -hmm. to have you with us, Nick. Um, let's go straight into it. I know you love books. What is the latest book that you read? Uh, actually, yes, it's a complicated question. Probably you need an AI to give you a more direct question. But uh, this this is the one I am reading at the moment, The Culture Map by Erin Mayer. Now, I'm saying I'm reading this, but I've, I've reached the last two pages, and I am savoring it so much that I've stopped reading it, in effect, because I don't want it to finish. Uh, and it is a great uh, book for leadership because it actually shows you how different cultures actually operate and uh, if you want to work with other people how you have to understand these other people it's about uh, cognitive uh, intelligence which is not mentioned as such here it's, it's a beautiful book a very easy book to read and i have jumped to my next book which i think we will be doing in the book club which i don't know comes like this hardback i found this second hand this is a 10 year old book and it is called uh, Multipliers. Okay. Uh, how the best leaders make everyone smarter. And it is a very, very clever book because it actually says that as a leader, if you work with other people and you believe with other people, the other people will actually develop, first of all, develop, and secondly, become much better. And therefore, your teams will become stronger. And, they, and they've got these uh, diminishes. They're, they're comparing the diminishes with the multipliers. And it is quite interesting to read sort of how a bad manager, someone who thinks that they are so clever that everybody else is stupid, uh, actually damages the, the environment and uh, uh, the, the, the team environment. And uh, very clever people stop producing because they're the top person uh, essentially takes all the decisions and, and ignores everybody. And, and it is a beautiful, again, an observation book. Both, uh, this is written by another lady, uh, Lise Wiseman. I'm quite impressed by, uh, the, by the fact that most of the books I'm reading seem to be written by ladies. Uh, so <laughs> you are taking over. So well, one thing I may say about AI is that it will not take over because ladies are taking over. It's the ladies that are taking over, not, not AI yeah. or the machine. Um, and man has become lazy, man like in male. Uh, you are doing so. That's good. Yeah. You are doing the reading. Men uh, are doing am, the yes, reading. yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I'm trying to learn. But these books are beautiful. And I hope uh, students of project management would uh, read these. Uh, but again, I, I don't read just the one book. Uh, there are other books. There's a book in the toilet. There's a book in the, next to the bath. There is a book downstairs in the sofa. There is a book in my pocket sometimes. And if I'm when I was allowed to walk around, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and 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 then I've read the books that uh, uh, we've been doing in the book club. Uh, thank you for mentioning the book club. We are very proud, Himantra and I. Uh, for for doing it and it is becoming more and more popular 
and uh, the books that I read uh, for the club, uh, I, I think, have helped me quite a lot. Again, the leadership books. Uh, Ma Suzanne Madsen's The Power of Project Leadership, where, which helps you coach yourself to become a better leader. Uh, Penny Pullen's, again, so many women, and there's none in here, but there's so many in my books. Uh, Virtual Leadership, uh, which was written before the pandemic, and Penny has now written a new book on, on virtual workshops, which should come out uh, soon. Uh, so I'm very much looking forward to that. I had the chance to read a, a bit of it and, and review it. So that was nice. Uh, we had Peter Taylor, the lazy project manager, who uh, is very much in favor of PMOs that you were mentioning earlier on. And uh, Peter's book is, is fantastic because it's one of the first books that uh, essentially told us and therefore maybe the, the, the AI in the future how to sit back and, and actually uh, be more effective by doing less, but being cleverly less. So he, it's actually productive laziness, not my sort of laziness. But there we go. Um, uh, is it? Um, I'm just. I just remember the quote. Uh, I, I can't remember whether it was Bill Gates who said, "I uh, usually uh, give the task to the laziest person because they know the shortest way, the shortest cut to do it." Um, and I think uh, this would apply to project managers, maybe? Indeed it is. A bit, uh, actually, the lazy project manager is quoting a, a Prussian uh, general whose name escapes me. This is a picture of the Prussian general <laughs> who, who came up with the idea that you were saying. Uh, yeah. Helmut Karl Bernhard Graf von Moltke from Prussia, yes, huge name and a military family themselves. And he said that uh, he would promote generals those who are lazy because uh, lazy and clever because they know how to find solutions. Okay. And those okay. who are clever, but, but always their hands are in the work, it will be this, the second layer of uh, military okay. uh, leadership. So, uh, yeah, uh, excellent. Yeah. So, lots of books here. Uh, many of them um, I haven't read, actually, to be honest. I only read the leadership ones. Uh, I was planning to, to complete, to finish the Lazy Project Manager. Now, what is your objective behind the, B, the PM, Project Management Book Club? You and Himanshu uh, founded this last year, and it's, uh, it's virtual, right? It's uh, virtual sessions mm -hmm. online. What is the objective and who is the audience? Is it practitioners, students, academics? Uh, yes, uh, it is a project management book club. It is not just a book club. Uh, usually book clubs are for literature things. And usually when you are on literature, very rarely do you have the author there because the author probably died 200 or 100 years ago or something. So what uh, Himanshu and I came up with is to have a book club where we will be able to bring the author himself or herself to actually come and talk to us. Last week, we had a very nice discussion with uh, Peter Taylor. We had a beautiful discussion with Penny Pullen, uh, who was our first book, uh, and uh, with Suzanne Madsen. So to, and just the ability to see the author and ask the author directly about the book uh, that has influenced you was what we want to do. So we, we discuss the book in two sessions, and then in the third session we get the uh, reader in. And uh, what we are learning with Himantri is that uh, uh, people come to the book club without having read the book. They don't. They just come in. It's like a radio program. They just uh, listen to the discussion and talk and listen to the people who have read. Uh, the book, so, so it is just an interesting listen. If you if you like uh, talk radio, you you like this, and if you're interested in uh, project management, then we will be doing different books. We are doing classic books. We want to do the uh, critical chain book, for example, which is a classic book, which is written as a novel itself, but it is a project management book, and it is about leadership and estimating. Uh, mostly in how, how to do things. Uh, we will try and do one academic book per year because the academic books are drier, but they give you the technical uh, 
uh, knowledge that, that that you need. And we are waiting for the project management body of knowledge itself the, to, to come out, and we, we hope to be the first to actually discuss it uh, in in public. But unfortunately, it was delayed from Mar March to November, so they're not bringing it out. Oh, okay. uh, yes. So so we'll wait and see. So this is what we're trying to do. And we may do a classic book. We're not sure. Mm -hmm. All about project management. Nadia is your the biggest fan, is uh, saying it's a fascinating venture. <laughs> uh, the idea of bringing the author and discussing with them is, um, is brilliant. And also, as you said, you don't actually need to finish the book or to read it completely uh, to benefit from a discussion with the author. Uh, now, Nick, I have many colleagues who are project managers and they ask me this question we don't have time to go to training courses we don't have time to do a degree msc degree or whatever in project management and we really want to learn in a fun way about project management and you know project management is both technical and and, and soft aspects so would you recommend a specific book one book or two to those who are interested in the field maybe they've done it already what they want to read about it in a more structured way uh, and they want to know the, the the soft and the hard skills any book come to mind uh, it is difficult because it is not one book you can pick one book for the technical uh, side of things uh, pmi has this uh, talent triangle where, where it it has split the competencies that you need to have as a project manager uh, into technical leadership and uh, business uh, competencies so probably you have the business competencies because you are from a business environment of some kind and maybe that is already there, that perspective. You need to learn the techniques of planning and for that you need any, any book actually to, to, to end up with a plan. And the beauty about plans is that we, we actually need a modern book for planning to combine both the agile and the more structured uh, approach to, to, to planning. Uh, but in the end, it all ends up as a shopping list of things to do. Yes. Now, whether you have post-its on a wall or you've got a breakdown structure or, or a gun chart or whatever, this is actually secondary, but you need that vocabulary. So the first thing I would say is pick up the technical part if you are an engineer, that would be nice and easy for you to pick up. If you're not an engineer, it is the, 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 the technology that you need to understand to become a project manager. And then we come to the third angle, which is the leadership. And I, I, that is never ending. In fact, if you understand what leadership is, means that you will be reading and learning throughout your life. So there is no one book. There is no quick fix for leadership. And but we are all leaders. Yes, a mother with a child is a leader. Yes, uh, I was just thinking, for example, that uh, a mother who uh, trains the child sort of and talks to it and explains what is going on is actually developing the child. While another mother who shouts at the child, "What are you doing? Get down over there!" and all that. Yes, it's a controlling. Uh, leaders. So both of them are leaders. And in this example, probably you can see very quickly who is the, the better one. And we don't go very further much away uh, from that. Uh, and, and, and in essence, it is two things, whether you work with the head or the heart or both. And uh, that is where the cultural bit becomes even more important. So there is no one book for the leadership. And you will understand it as soon as you become a leader. There is no one way. Yeah, definitely. I agree with you. Uh, mm -hmm. I've, I've, uh, when I was talking to Fouad earlier, uh, we mentioned the idea of project or, or maybe machines replacing project managers. Uh, now, regardless of this, regardless of whether we can teach machines how to become leaders, can we actually teach people how to become lead leaders? And how, how do you reconcile the idea that leaders are born with the idea that read some books and attend some training and you become a leader. So which one you are more inclined towards and why? Leaders are not born. This is a mistake from an age uh, where we were even, uh, didn't even uh, respect females, let alone uh, uh, 
humans as such. And, and uh, the, the reason why we make that mistake is because we see leaders when they're leading. We do not see leaders when they're behind the scenes and all the worries that they have. It's, it's a bit like looking at an actor and saying actors are born. They're not really born. We only see the final result, but they do a lot of work behind the scenes and they have a lot of worries uh, behind the scenes and they make hundreds and thousands of mistakes. Uh, and that is what makes them leaders. So this idea that leaders are born is not correct. And we know also we have many examples where you've been thrown into leadership because suddenly a situation arises and you have to deal with it. So, so we, we learn leadership. And this book, that is why I like this book here, the Multipliers book, is precisely that. It has a non-multiplying, uh, <laughs> not very sexy as a book, but there we go. Uh, because that is, she, uh, uh, Liz Wiseman, has all these examples where you can see a person who, not performing and then suddenly they start performing that is they are being developed they themselves become leaders by a better uh, leaders so, so uh, it can be learned and this is this, these these are the examples uh, this, this this is the idea of the multipliers book okay in that sense then can we teach machines to become leaders at some point uh, this is this is all depending on uh, what, what you understand uh, machines are doing and now they're in this probabilistic and stochastic uh, uh, environment, but the machine is all zeros and ones, actually all the connections in the end are zeros and ones. And uh, uh, if you look at the, the neural uh, mind, the, the, the mind of, of, of the human, the, the connections are not one-to-one -one as they are usually on a microchip. It's all full of one-to-one -one connections. So, so that physical uh, constraint in itself appears to be a barrier for what uh, AI can do. But AI will become a tool in the same way that uh, a fork becomes a tool. Yes, and therefore when you eat, you, you, with the fork, you eat easier, but you don't always eat with the fork. You've got it in a tool uh, uh, box. So, so uh, AI will help, but it will not uh, solve all the problems. We, we have tried and we're still trying. Uh, when I was a software engineer, we were trying to put the input on this side and get the machine code actually coming out from the other side. So AI to do the code itself, from a diagram to the code. And uh, that one is always getting more and more. And, but we, we have to be, we are impressed by the fastness with which the machine works. It is just quicker than, than us, but quicker on simple things. Yes, and I'm always impressed with the camera. Whenever it looks at my face, it puts a square. It recognizes where, where, where my face is and all that. And I'm always fascinated how quickly it does that. But that is pattern recognition. And what I would like to have asked uh, Mr. Issa was uh, <laughs> when he this thing about uh, cancer and recognizing uh, cancer, actually pigeons, are better at it than, than uh, AI machines at the moment. So, so the little brain of the pigeon seems to still be uh, ahead. It's, it's a very strange and fascinating experiment with pigeons working to identify cancer cells, actually, from pictures. Interesting. But, um, I would love to continue this conversation, but um, we, uh, we actually um, approached our final minute. It's it's already two o'clock. So thank you, uh, Nick, for joining. And thank you for all the information on uh, the PM uh, Book Club is on LinkedIn. Uh, they can follow PM Book Club, uh, Project Management Book Club. And it's on uh, Meetup as well, on Meetup, if you want to follow the group and uh, get the notification. Uh, thank you, Nick, for joining. And have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. For all our audience, uh, it was lovely to uh, be live again. And um, our next episode is on the last Wednesday of uh, March, which will be the 31st of March. And uh, it will be a very exciting topic on sustainability. So um, book your uh, calendar on that date. Until we are live again, stay safe, healthy, and positive.
And from us at PM Radio Westminster, have a nice day and goodbye.